Welcome. I'm John Hart, the co-founder of C3 Solutions, the Conservative Coalition for Climate Solutions, and the executive editor of our news magazine, C3. And today we're hosting a very special webinar discussion on our new report, Free Economies or Clean Economies. And that's actually the second edition of our report on economic freedom. And so today we're, we're thrilled to have uh, Drew Bond, the president, the co-founder of C3 Solutions, and Nick Loris, the VP of Public Policy. And uh, we're looking forward to diving into this report. And I thought, Drew, why don't you give us an overview of, of who we are as an organization and why this report is foundational to not just our work, but the work of uh, you know, free market conservatives in the environmental space. Yeah, thanks, John. Thanks for the intro. And uh, as usual, thanks for your good communications leadership. Um, yeah, you know, the, as you well know, right, I mean, the organization really started with you and I talking about solar on your farm. And, uh, and we got kind of a good laugh about the fact that you know, here you are as a farmer looking looking at trying to figure out how to you know be a better steward of your property, and and solar could be an element of that. And and I actually have a solar company, uh, and so two conservatives, you know, very much free market oriented, interested in things like private property rights and how do we better steward our environment, and that really led to this idea that, you know, there's there's a lot of conservatives out there, libertarians, right of center people that truly care about the environment. We just don't speak the language of the environmental left. Um, but we do believe in leaving things better than we found them. We believe in the power of free markets. We believe in the power of people and, and bottom up solutions. And so, uh, you know, it's just been a joy to be able to launch this organization uh, over two years ago. Uh, you know, we took the bull by the horns, naming it the Conservative Coalition uh, for, for Climate Solutions. Uh, many people thought, you know, maybe that was a bad idea, but look, we, uh, you know, unapolog unapologetically, you know, said, look, uh, climate is changing. Uh, you know, it's not the end of the world, like some say it is in 10 years. Uh, we can adapt and we can innovate. And, and ultimately, it's the, it's, the, it's the free market, it's conservative principles and policies that, that really underpin that. So to your question about this report, the Free Economies, Clean Economies report, it really is foundational for our organization um, from a principal perspective, but also because, you know, we've got Nick Loris on, on with us and Nick wrote the first report and now the second one. And, uh, and when you look at economic freedom and the track record versus the opposite of economic freedom, which is countries that are, you know, economically unfree, it just is very clear, it's, it's really common sense that economic freedom leads to a cleaner environment. And so this is an opportunity for conservatives, for free market thinking people, people sort of center right, even center left for that matter, to, to recognize that uh, critical elements uh, that underpin our society, our democratically free and civil society in America particularly, are, are, are really important, uh, not only for the future of our society, but also for the future of our environment. Right. And that's great. And just to, to fill in, just for for people that may not be familiar with our group, is uh, is you know I worked for Senator Tom Coburn for years. Drew worked for uh, Senator Nichols and also Ed Fulner, who at the Heritage Foundation, who wrote the forward to the report. And but even backing up, even before uh, this really issue got politicized, President Reagan and Margaret Thatcher figured out that economic freedom is a foundational message. Uh, one of my mentors was a member of the Reagan National Security Council, Walt Raymond. And in memos that were, were have since been declassified, they identified the environment as one of the issues that can mobilize and organize the freedom movement around the world against what they described as the sorry state of the Soviet Union. And so we're, it's important to emphasize, we're not talking about a new idea here. We're talking about reapplying ideas that have been proven true really throughout history and and uh, I give Nick a lot of credit, uh, just as we, as we transition to talk about the report, is, you know, there's a lot of things in life that are common sense, <clears throat> but it's another, it's a, a totally different project to research and organize and provide a rigorous framework for understanding and describing what common sense really means and backing up those, those, uh, those beliefs with data. And so I think what Nick has done is done a masterful job. So Nick, why don't you talk us or walk us through uh, the report itself, but also before you do, just give give us some understanding of, of how this idea really came about 
and and why you tackled this? Yeah, uh, you know, a big part of it came about because, you know, I think you guys recognize from the very inception of C3 how important economic freedom is to environmental well-being and protection. And therefore, you know, it's important to understand what economic freedom means uh, and how it does contribute to um, not only more prosperous societies, more human flourishing, more technological innovation, but also better environmental outcomes. I think one thing that you know the left, center, and right should be able to agree on is we want you know, breathable air, we want clean drinking water, you know, we want to reduce the risks and costs of climate change. Uh, and how do we do that? You know, what are the best ways um, to get to those better outcomes of a healthier environment, taking into consideration, you know, costs and benefits of policies, looking at opportunity costs and trade-offs. And I think what this report aims to do uh, from the first year that we wrote, wrote it is really look at what are those principles that make a country economically free and why does it result in higher levels of environmental well-being and protection. Um, and so what we did from the very beginning was look at, you know, one of the major indices of economic freedom, which is the Heritage Foundation's Index of Economic Freedom that's been around uh, for, you know, several decades now. And it pulls data from uh, a number of uh, international sites, um, domestic sites as well, things like the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and the World Economic Forum to measure what makes a country economically free. And Heritage boils it down into four broader categories, the rule of law, which measures things like private property rights and judicial effectiveness and government integrity, freedom of corruption, things like that. Uh, the government size, so looking at tax burdens, government spending rates, Regulatory efficiency, which is certainly critical for the issues we work on, um, everything from business freedom and labor freedom, uh, but also looking at monetary policy too. Um, and then lastly, open markets, which is everything from trade policy, but also investment and financial freedom. Uh, and so looking at those metrics, um, you know, what we did with this report um, two years in a row now was look at how do those metrics correlate with uh, outcomes for environmental performance. And the other big um, database that we used for this correlation was Yale's Environmental Performance Index. And they publish a report every two years, which looks at um, a, a number of different environmental indices. I think they've got more than 40 in their database um, into broader categories as well, everything from climate change, but also broader environmental health, like we all care about, biodiversity, air quality, um, drinking water, um, you know, everything from fisheries and water resources and agriculture as well. And what we found um, two years in a row now uh, is that, you know, freer economies are cleaner economies. And again, that's probably not all that surprising to people who follow uh, these issues and understand what economic freedom is, because it is those principles of private property rights uh, having strong institutions that enforce equal protection under the law for all businesses and all people, uh, as well as the importance of economic freedom to higher levels of per capita income that gives people the resources to dedicate to environmental protection. And I think that's one thing we've seen consistently uh, throughout this report and why uh, economic freedom is so important to you know so many factors that make our lives um, healthier, happier, more prosperous, um, but also more environmentally cleanly, is that it gives us more resources and, and more wealth. And, and it's these societies that allow for more technological innovation. And so I'm really excited by this report because I, I do think it provides the foundation to address uh, a lot of the environmental challenges we face today, whether that's at a very local level or whether those are in international, you know, global type of challenges, things like ocean plastics and climate change, I think it's a good lens by which policymakers, communities, and the private sector should look through when they think about solutions to our biggest environmental challenges. Yeah, and, and Drew, why don't why don't you talk some about your your recent trip? Uh, you, you recently went to to Budapest, and as an organization, we've we've weighed in we've weighed in, we've weighed in aggressively with with um with this topic uh, last year at the at the cop conference we had liam fox who's the former defense minister of, of the uk of the uk uh speak to an audience about economic freedom but drew why don't, maybe if you could elaborate some on on why this is so important uh, 
not just in our context, but more broadly internationally. Yeah, I think, you know, it's so interesting. I mean, we in America are obviously very American centric. So it's always important to when you can travel the world and sort of listen to other people and, and how they are thinking and talking about issues. And so I had the opportunity to go over to, to Budapest, Hungary, uh, just last week and uh, speak at a conference. It was the second annual uh, geopolitical and, and security conference that was hosted by the Danube Institute. Uh, and the Danube Institute actually is uh, led by John O'Sullivan, one of the, the, the editors of the National Review early on and for a long time, and uh, he and his wife. And uh, so really just a world class organization. And, and, you know, they brought in leaders from around the world, including, you know, Vaclav Klaus uh, and Tony Abbott. You know, Klaus was former prime minister and, and president of the, of the Czech Republic. Uh, Tony Abbott, longtime former prime minister of Australia. You had energy experts and, and climate experts and economic experts all uh, sort of talking about the, the geopolitics of, of, of all types of issues, energy and climate being, being among those. And, you know, in, in Europe, it's, it's very uh, uh, clear uh, and, and, and almost, uh, I don't know, too normal in some respects that the discussion quick, quickly veers towards the war in Ukraine. Uh, and we in America, you know, see that as a far off foreign policy issue and maybe you're for it or maybe you're against it. Maybe you, you know, don't really track it at all. Um, but it certainly has an impact uh, and more so an impact on the people's lives there in Ukraine and in those Eastern European countries. And and one of the you know, clear lessons learned that we see is, is that, uh, frankly, you know, bad climate policy can be worse than, than bad climate change. And and, I, you know, you can say that sort of tongue in cheek, but. But it's, it's really true when you look at uh, countries like Germany and the policies that they've implemented in terms of their green agenda. Um, and I'm not saying I'm anti-green, right? I'm, I'm, I have a solar company. I'm, I'm in favor of environmental technologies. I'm in favor of reducing our environmental input and, and, and footprint. Um, but when the green agenda becomes so far extreme that uh, you know, you, you've lost common sense and, and like in Germany, they've you know, gone away from uh, base load fossil fuels um, and then turned on the spigot to Russian natural gas, uh, which then enabled uh, Putin to invade Ukraine. And now Europe finds itself in a very uh, energy insecure, vulnerable position this winter. Uh, and, and, you know, there's all kinds of talk and practices around rationing energy. Um, and, you know, distributing blankets and, you know, things like that, that, that are hard for us to imagine here in the U.S. But, you know, these are the types of issues that are really, really critical as we think about, you know, energy and climate and the nexus between energy, climate and economic growth, uh, because fundamentally people want to prosper. People want to prosper in an environment that they really care about and that it also helps them prosper. I mean, none of us want to live in a pollution filled landfill, right? I mean, we want to live out in a farm where it's green and, and the air is fresh. And if we want to live in a city, we want to know that, you know, where the city's air is going to be as fresh and clean as possible, and the systems are going to be up to date and efficient. And, and so, you know, we just time and time again, see that with the cities in Europe and the countries in Europe and, and here in the United States is that we really have a lot in common in that regard, right? I mean, people fundamentally want uh, want a better future. And, and so part of this fight that we see over, you know, climate or not climate or fossil fuels or not fossil fuels is about the future. It's about how do we see the future? And, and I think one of the things I hope people take from this report is that there's a lot of hope uh, in terms of the track record that economic freedom brings and a lot of hope in terms of if you want innovation or if you want adaptation or if you could care less about climate, but you know you want your country to be the best in the world. Well, you can have all of those things if if we actually expand economic freedom not only here in the United States but globally. Yeah, and yeah. just to piggyback off that real quick, John. Uh, you know, Drew, to your point about bad policy being worse uh, than you know climate change, for instance. You know, if you look at Germany's decision to shutter its nuclear power plants that dates back you know more than a decade now after the Fukushima accident in Japan. You know, that was not a science-based decision. It was, you know, a fear-based decision. And there have been economic analyses that have shown that the decision 
uh, to shutter those nuclear power plants actually resulted in more deaths and fatalities because you have higher rates of mortality when energy prices are expensive because you know people freeze uh, and more people die in the winter time. And the, if you artificially raise those prices by needlessly shutting off your nuclear power plants and by the way, turning on more coal-fired power plants, which increases emissions, you've driven up those energy prices higher to the people have a, a much higher risk of those winter mortality rates. So I think that there's a lot of bad policy decisions that have been not driven and informed by sound, objective, and transparent science. And we certainly need to get away from that, not just in the United States, but really around the world. Right, Nick, and that's a great point. I th and I think that the paradigm that I think both you and Drew have, have described here, the difference is really a, one of a top-down versus bottom-up approach. And, and to, to draw another metaphor from Germany is at the end of the Cold War, the line of demarcation between East and West wasn't just the Berlin Wall. It was a line of soot between East Germany, West Germany, where one part of the city was clean, the other part, visibly, you literally could see a line where the soot was on the East German and again, that that illustrates very profoundly the the, the damage that comes from the top down versus the bottom up. And Nick, I, I think it'd be interesting if if you could talk about some of the case studies or examples of countries uh, that that were either surprising or what you expected, or just um, that drive this point home. And I think a couple that you mentioned, uh, if you could touch on, especially is Dominican Republic and Haiti. What are the lessons that we can draw from from those two countries? Yeah, uh, and and two things I'll start with, and and you know I think we all consider ourselves you know pretty optimistic about um, you know both the the future of the planet from an economic standpoint and as well as you know the health from a climate change standpoint. And you know Todd Myers at the Washington Policy Center has done a lot of good work on this, and he just wrote a book in Time to Think Small where he talks about all of these bottom up in energy innovations and innovations broadly that are helping solve a, a lot of these challenges, everything from apps on our phone to some bigger types of um, policies and, and empowering the private sector to clean up ocean plastic and things like that. So I'd recommend that, you know, if you look at some of the, um, the countries who perform the best in terms of environmental performance, uh, you know, if you look at some of the Scandinavian countries, for instance, I think a, a lot of people don't necessarily think of them as the the bastions of economic liberty, but you know, in a lot of respects, they are because they are have such open markets and such regulatory uh, efficiency. So, you know, a country like Denmark, you know, if you think you know, moving down a little further, a country like Switzerland, uh, you know, these countries perform well on both indices because they have open markets and because they are able to build things fast. And, you know, that's a challenge that, you know, a lot of places, including the United States, um, does uh, not do very well. I think, it, you know, you've seen the frustration increasingly on both sides of the aisle with the inability to permit things in the United States. And that's probably a discussion for either later in this webinar or um, for a, a whole separate webinar, because there's a lot to get into there. But there are other good examples, you know, and you mentioned Haiti and the Dominican Republic is something we pointed out both in, in this report and our climate and freedom agenda. Um, you know, it's, they, they share the same island. Um, one is much more uh, prosperous, the Dominican Republic, than in Haiti. Uh, you know, they started out relatively similar, but the Dominican Republic has in implemented a fair amount of reforms that have helped uh, raise their profile in terms of economic freedom. Um, and, you know, Haiti has gone in the exact opposite way. Uh, and so if you look at both their economic freedom scores and their environmental performance scores, they're, they're trending in uh, opposite directions. And you've seen everything from extreme weather events that have hit the island uh, that, you know, Haiti is much more vulnerable to something like an earthquake uh, because they don't have the higher levels of income to uh, prepare for uh, an extreme weather event to recover from an extreme weather event. They have higher levels of government corruption. Corruption. They've had higher levels of uh, deforestation, uh, a number of different environmental and economic problems. And you know, one of the broader points that we made in this report was looking at the ability to adapt to climate change as well, because you know I think we all believe that 
you know, mitigation is an important part of the climate strategy, but in the near term, the ability to adapt and become more resilient is a, a cost effective way, if done properly, to save lives and reduce the risks from extreme weather events and from climate change more broadly. Uh, and you have a country like the Dominican Republic who has that wealth and ability to build more resilient buildings, houses, infrastructure to protect themselves from extreme weather events. And so we did a correlation uh, in this year's report that is different than last year's report that we used Notre Dame's um, Global Adaptation Index. Uh, this is something that they've been putting out for, uh, I believe, a few years now. And again, it speaks to that need for um, more wealth for environmental protection because it results in a country reducing its vulnerability and increasing its readiness for all types of extreme weather events, whether they're driven by climate change or not. You know, I think we would all agree that it's practical to reduce those risks um, from hurricanes and from tornadoes and uh, flooding and extreme rainfall. You know, all, all of these things are going to happen with or without increases in greenhouse gas emissions, the more that countries can adapt and protect themselves, the better off they're going to be. Yeah, and you specifically mentioned Hurricane Jean, which I believe killed 3,000 people on Haiti, but only 19 in the Dominican Republic. So again, that's a very stark line of you know, difference between a relatively free country versus one that's, that's not free. Yeah, and John, John, I just want to underscore that. I mean, you know, what is it, 3,000 versus 19? I mean, because I'm, I'm sure the only thing you heard in the media was 3,000 people died in Haiti. Therefore, you know, look at the, the, the tragic impacts of climate change, right? right. And again, not to under, like, we're, we're a climate, you know, we have climate in our name, right? I mean, we're saying that climate change is real. This is a risk. Um, and and but you know when when overblown politicians uh, you know when the issue is overblown politicians will take measures that are that are not in the right direction and so I mean that's just an incredible analogy like real life analogy to show how that three thousand people died in in, a, in one case and nineteen in another both on the same island you know you could blame both on climate change but clearly the the, the wealth and adaptation that comes from a country that embraces principles around economic freedom are, are really, you know, tangible and, and really important. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I just, you know, this is something that, you know, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change talks about, too. And that's something, you know, we're not, you know, making this up by any means or just pulling out, you know, data that was concocted in our basements. We're, you know, we're using uh, data from you know, organizations that are, are very reputable, like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that talks about, you know, when wealth goes up, their vulnerability from climate change goes down. Uh, and so by all means, that's not the only thing they're talking about in the breadth of their, you know, huge, huge reports on the complexities of climate change and the costs and the risks uh, and what future projections look like. But it's just a, a very simple message because when, countries are more economically free, they they have the ability to kind of raise their economic profile, raise their levels of per capita income, raise those levels of wealth. Uh, and that's important to address climate change moving forward. Right. And I think what we're saying is, is cl climate change is a risk, but bad climate policy can be deadly. And that's what we just saw with Haiti. And that's what we're seeing unfold in real time. Again, in Ukraine, as Drew mentioned earlier, is that we it, it, the left's command and control policies were implemented. Europe and Germany, especially, quote, went green, but they really outsourced their emissions to Russia and quite literally fueled Putin's war machine. So these these policies have have quite extreme life life and death consequences. And and one of the things Nick Nick you mentioned and, and that we've done is is the climate freedom agenda that really addresses climate policy within the U.S. So. You know, I think one of the takeaways is, you know, why does all this matter? Where do we go from here? How do you, how do you want this report on economic freedom to influence and affect public policy in the U.S. within a climate and freedom agenda framework? Yeah, well, it gets back to something that uh, Dr. Ed Fulner, who wrote the forward, former president and founder of the Heritage Foundation, you know, said is that you know, with each vote and each law that passes in in congress uh you know economic freedom either increases or decreases a little bit sometimes by a lot uh and so it's important to 
evaluate uh, a lot of those policies based on whether or not they increase economic freedom or not. And, and a lot of times it's the bills and pieces of legislation that increase economic freedom that will actually help with energy affordability, energy security, and environmental protection. And so our, our climate and freedom agenda was to really you know, shine a light on all of the work that have been done by policymakers, uh, oftentimes from both sides of the aisle, uh, as well as a lot of policy analysis from you know, more classically liberal uh, free market think tanks, whether it's the Property and Environment Research Center in Bozeman um, or the Tax Foundation here in DC, looking at policies that can uh, liberate markets and increase opportunities for innovation and investment into clean technologies. You know, we talk a lot about uh, erasing that green premium and turning clean technologies into an economic advantage because it's uh, the best way possible for uh, the United States to adopt those cleaner technologies and reduce emissions, but it's also the best way for uh, the developing world to adopt those clean technologies and practices. If it's in their economic interest to do so, uh, there's a better chance that they're actually going to pursue those technologies. And so this climate and freedom agenda has 10 different chapters on everything from renewable energy policy to nuclear power, permitting reform, ag policy, looking at ways in which we can you know, build faster, innovate more, invest more, and uh, increase the supplies of energy so that we uh, aren't faced with these higher levels of, uh, you know, gas prices, as well as electricity rates and, and higher levels of inflation broadly, uh, but also so we can collaborate more with our allies in ways that make both economic sense and environmental sense. And so you know, we see this as kind of the policy playbook for legislators moving forward in ways to increase economic growth and prosperity, but also to really uh, inspire global leadership in climate change. You know, I think that the rest of the world certainly looks to the United States to be a leader. And I think one of the reasons they do is because a lot of uh, interesting and, uh, you know, potentially game changing innovations come out of, uh, you know, the US economy, whether that's our, our research institutions, our national labs, but certainly the private sector as well. And we just want to see more of it. We kind of want to supercharge it and we want to uh, you know, as most effectively as possible, um, get the government out of the way and, and not in a way that, you know, eliminates the, the federal government by any means, um, but actually makes it work more efficiently. And, and so we see the, the rules of the game um, being enforced equally uh, among energy sources and technologies. And we think that there's a, a lot of hope and a lot of potential to reduce some of those government imposed barriers that stand in the way of more clean energy innovation and more uh, conservation broadly. Yeah, and permitting reform is one of the is one of the areas of emphasis that that you recommend in the climate freedom agenda. And that's been in the news a lot lately. What are your what are your thoughts about the the possibilities of anything moving uh, really in the next two years on that on that issue? Yeah, kind of cautiously optimistic. I think there's been frustration. Uh, among some of the folks who want to see permitting reform that the the latest pieces of legislation, the Mansion Bill, uh, didn't have enough teeth to get to the root of the structural problems with permitting reform. And, and a lot of that has to deal with the litigious activists who block projects, oftentimes blocking projects that would result in more clean energy getting to the market, in more uh, activities like prescribed burns that would help reduce the risks and costs of wildfires. Uh, and so a lot of the times these projects are are blocked uh, by uh, lawyers and they're held up for years in the courts. Uh, and therefore, it, it not only squeezes uh, the economic like blood out of a project, but it also prolongs the possibility and the risk that we could um, have something like a wildfire take place. And so uh, the mansion bill didn't really get at the heart of that. It made some marginal improvements, but it, it didn't quite actually fix some of these systemic problems. And I think the the risk is if you pass a bill that has some marginal reforms, you know, that's okay. And any progress is good progress. But at the same time, if legislators kind of, you know, wipe their hands of permitting reform and say, okay, we did our job, you know, let's let the market take it from here without actually fixing some of these bigger structural problems, uh, you know, you might not get another bite at the apple anytime soon. And so, my hope is that you know more uh, Republicans and Democrats will come to the table to work together on more comprehensive permitting reform, uh, 
Um, neither the, the right nor the left were really happy with both the content and the, the process of how Manchin went about through his bill. But I do think that you know now is the ripe opportunity to tackle permitting reform because it is obstructing everything from transmission to new nuclear uh, to conservation efforts. Uh, and I think that there's a growing sentiment on uh, the left that this is a, a very big problem. You've seen a number of kind of high profile uh, left leaning columnists like Ezra Klein from the New York Times talk about the problems of the National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA. And so I think the more we can raise the profile of this permitting bugaboo that has obstructed uh, clean energy innovation, you know, the better off we're going to have a chance at, at really enacting meaningful reform that gets to the heart and, and we can actually see the uh, investment and building that we need to have to um, address some of these bigger issues. Yeah, and I think in, in addition to permitting reform, energy innovation, both broadly in the sense of, of giving the free, the free market the freedom they need to innovate, to have a truly technology neutral approach, uh, that also can, can be balanced with, with investing in basic research and development and reform within, within the Department of Energy. And, and we're lucky that Drew has, has firsthand experience there as, as a former senior advisor to the Bush administration. So Drew, maybe you could talk a little, a little bit about how Congress can balance the, the need to be tech neutral and support all of the above, while at the same time doing, doing what's appropriate to have a light touch in these areas where we can have more re basic research and development on into clean energy or cleaner energy with fossil fuel? Yeah, I, you know, I think it's a really important question, you know, and as you noted, I had the opportunity to work at, at the Department of Energy under George W. Bush uh, as, a, as a senior advisor on technology commercialization and policy. So this is the intersection that we're talking about. And you know, you look at, at where we are as a, as a country in the world of, of greenhouse gas emissions. The United States has reduced our greenhouse gas emissions faster than anybody else in the last 20 years, thanks to innovation. Now, part of that innovation started at the Department of Energy uh, in the fossil office, actually. Uh, and, but the bulk of the innovation really happened in the private sector. Uh, and that innovation, of course, that I'm talking about is the natural gas fracking revolution that, that really unlocked reserves that, that we didn't even know were possible here in the United States and around the world. And so it was a really, you know, a, a light touch approach in terms of energy R&D. Um, you know, the Department of Energy has 17 national labs around the country. These are world class institutions of research and innovation that happens. Uh, the Department of Energy partners with universities, with companies, with students, with you know small companies, medium, you know, you name it. And and so you know there's there's just an incredible amount of of research that goes on in partnership with the Department of Energy. But I think it's again really critical to to emphasize here that it's a public private partnership where the public government role is much smaller than the than the private sector, uh, you know. Uh, business role. And, and just to give you an example, I mean, 2021 20, figures, the United States actually led the world in energy R&D at the, at, in terms of government funded energy R&D, $9.2 billion, okay? $9.2 $9 billion energy R&D 2021. That was government funded. In that same year, $105 billion was private sector money going into the United States uh, from investors on the clean energy space. So almost a 10 to one ratio of private sector versus public sector. And I think that's really the kind of balance that we want to be able to strike here is, you know, the, the federal government clearly has a role to play in investing in, in, in energy R&D. Um, we want to be careful not to crowd out um, private sector investments. Um, and and so there's a there's a balancing act to be played. I mean, there's there's clearly opportunities in, in areas like, you know, fusion, where simply, you know, the private sector is not going to uh, invest in, right? That, that has to be developed first in a lab, proven at scale outside of a lab before investors will actually take that risk on to replicate that technology. And, and you can look at other forms of, you know, innovation like that um, across the board. And so to your point about, you know, all the above, um, you know, I, I really, uh, really would emphasize, you know, uh, that, you know, Congress 
look for opportunities that are technology neutral, that allow the technologies to flourish in a way that the market can really absorb them and, and, and not absorb them, but you know, for lack of a better word, it just really accelerate the growth of those technologies. And you know, no one would have guessed that the, the, the fracking technology could have done what it did. Um, because at the time that, it, that the investment was happening at the Department of Energy, natural gas was so cheap, nobody thought it, would, it was worthwhile going any deeper to get more gas. Um, and of course that all changed. And so when you think about the innovation today, you know, what, what we know of is, you know, we know solar, we know wind, we know biofuels, we know hydro, you know, we know, you know, various forms of, of uh, you know, small modular nuclear reactor technologies. Those are, you know, uh, being developed as we speak. Um, but some of those technologies like solar, for instance, um, you know, we're pouring a lot of money through subsidies into the solar industry in the United States and the wind industry in the United States, these are mature technologies. They, they frankly don't need subsidies. And I would prefer that policymakers look at ways of diverting those subsidies into earlier stage research uh, where we can really potentially have some breakthroughs. Uh, and, and this is coming from a CEO of a solar company, right? I'm not asking for subsidies. I want actually the subsidies to get out of the way because they've in many cases hurt my ability to develop projects faster because it takes so much time and money with the lawyers chasing after the tax credits. Um, when instead we ought to be deploying this technology and those billions of dollars for these subsidies for mature technologies should instead go for earlier stage technologies that have not been developed, that we haven't even dream dreamed up yet. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great distinction. Um, and as, as we go forward, what are what are some of the other priorities, Nick, that, that we haven't touched on? Any, anything that, that has come out of, of, of your recent research and also the climate freedom agenda that ought to be a front burner issue in 2023 and 24? Yeah, well, yeah, one priority for me and I think us as an organization that uh, you know, I think we, we fight some challenges on both sides of the aisle is you know, trying to keep markets as open as possible and, and really increasing trade with our allies. Uh, you know, it's uh, something that when President, President Emmanuel Macron was over here uh, last week, you know, lamented the fact that the Inflation Reduction Act could result in some green protectionism based on the way some of the tax credits uh, are focused for things like batteries and electric vehicles, that they have these domestic content requirements, and therefore you could uh, crowd out opportunities for other countries who are allies with the United States to supply those resources or those vehicles uh, at a lower cost. And therefore, you're benefiting consumers if you do that, but you're also getting more bang for your buck in terms of emissions reductions. And I think that there's a, a general understanding and need that we don't want to be reliant on China. Uh, we certainly don't want to be buying solar panels or using minerals that have been extracted or ma made from Uyghur slave labor by any means, but at the same time, that doesn't mean we should have all of these provisions uh, that obstruct our ability to trade freely with our allies. And that works both ways too. You know, I think one of the things we've highlighted in both the climate and freedom agenda and in our writings on C3 Newsmag this year is the fact that American liquefied natural gas is a lot cleaner than Russian natural gas. And the more we can build and export that LNG uh, to our allies, it, it won't only help from a geopolitical standpoint and an energy security standpoint, but it'll also help from a, a climate standpoint. And so this needs to work both ways. I think it's one of those you know, fundamental challenges right now because you see this rise of uh, populism and nationalism that I think could be well intended, but a lot of the policies could be very misguided. And so I think the need to keep markets open, flexible, um, and the policies necessary to do so is something that uh, I, I think we should be focused on, but I think you know a lot of uh, think tanks and, and policymakers should be focused on as well. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Um, so I'd encourage you to, to go to our, our website, c3solutions.org, and you can read this free economies or clean economies report, as well as our climate and freedom agenda. And also you can follow us at C3 News Mag. And again, I'm John Hartz. I'm the co-founder of C3 Solutions and the editor of our news magazine, C3. Been with Drew Bond and Nick Loris. And guys, look forward to doing this again soon. 
And uh, Nick, great job on the report. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll achieve economic freedom and won't have to do this report every year. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> I think we'll be doing it. Might be out of a job if we do that, though. <laughs> right. All right. Thanks, all.